and I go full screen mode to make it. So do you see it also full screen? Yes, perfect. OK, perfect. OK, so um, uh, thank you once again for uh, uh, for the for the introduction and uh, um, and for the invitation to to attend this uh, uh, this uh, symposium. Um, today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, application of machine learning for opt optimal flow control in uh, Excel compressor. So what we are actually focusing on is uh, the control of a uh, turbo machinery. Uh, I was not an expert of turbo machine, neither uh, am I at the moment, but uh, I, I started uh, uh, getting involved in uh, turbo machinery since when I joined uh, NSAM. And so I, I hope this way of uh, the way I, I'm going to follow for uh, presenting uh, is going to help people to enter in the topic because I try to reply to the questions I would have uh, liked to be replied when I arrived here to get into the uh, into the topic uh, as fast and as uh, fundamentally as possible. Uh, the idea is I'm um, uh, I'm trying to 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 follow a way to present that's more like physically based and fundamental, less uh, application based. Even if we have to keep in mind that uh, that's flow control for an actual application in uh, in aeronautics. So if I uh, if I introduce some trivial uh, uh, concepts you uh, I hope you will forgive me but <laughs> the, the the point would be trying to to have all the audience on the same page okay so uh, first of all here you find the setup we consider uh, that's our uh, uh, experiments in the lab here at uh, at Ensam. and uh, all the uh, and the inside this compressor, what you will find is basically a rotor blade which rotates with a given uh, angular velocity uh, omega, and there is a stator blade afterwards. That's the uh, part where the uh, flow gets uh, realigned with the with the compressor. And right prior to the uh, to the rotor blade, we inject some flow and we try to control the flow by uh, uh, compressed air uh, supply that gets blowed inside the, the actuators or the injectors uh, operating flow control over 40 different injectors, so 20 couples of injectors. Um, I just want to, before starting with the presentation, I just want to thank uh, the collaborators on, on this project, uh, Antoine Dazan, uh, Jean-Christophe Loiseau, and in particular, uh, Mohamed El, El Hawari, who is the PhD student working on uh, machine learning uh, for uh, post-processing and uh, interpretation of this data. And basically, the work you will see is uh, uh, mainly done by, by, by Mohamed. So, um, Special thanks to him. So uh, let's uh, let's start with the motivation. Why do we want to control the flow in uh, uh, in uh, axial compressors? Uh, the uh, the reason why we want to do it is that axial compressors can run into uh, rotating instabilities and may that may lead to rotating style uh, of the compressor. Rotating style actually tends to block and uh, degrade significantly the performance of the compressor, uh, leading to uh, uh, to strong oscillations of the flow or even uh, uh, strong detrimental effect for uh, for the uh, compressor, the whole engine, up to uh, potentially leading to surge. So these are typical uh, stable config uh, configuration where no separation of the tip leakage vortex is observed at the compressor. But when we get rotating instabilities, you see these vertical structures that detach uh, from the tip leakage uh, between the blades and the carter, and they can lead to inception of stall when they create coherent structures uh, that afterwards they, uh, they block basically a part of the blade and then they can uh, develop in larger structures behind the compressor leading to a uh, decay of performances. So if you uh, if you read the physics in terms of performance, then you can 
kind of clearly identify uh, what the inception of uh, the rotating stall is. So a developed uh, instability which becomes so massive that you see it in the performance. So if you consider the baseline case where we do not control the flow, we don't jet, we don't we don't blow air via our uh, injectors. Uh, what you would see is that the flow rate phi that's the flow rate incoming uh, sucked, let's say, by, by, by the compressor, um, is depicted at the bottom axis, and psi is actually the uh, pressure difference, the total to static pressure difference across the, the compressor. So uh, the point is when, when we decrease the flow rate, we can run into an instability uh, and um, we, uh, in this case, we can, we, we increase the performance, but we want to arrive at the point that uh, we are not too close to the instability because we want to operate the, the uh, compressor in a safe regime. So uh, normally uh, you decrease the flow rate, you increase the psi, this uh, uh, normalized pressure uh, pressure uh, difference. Uh, so you increase the performance in this sense. Um, but when, when the instability occurs, uh, if you decrease even further your phi, you may run into a strong decay of performance because a huge part of your compressor gets blocked. And in fact, you see it in this sort of uh, uh, sharp jump between uh, highly performed performing compressors and uh, uh, low performance regimes. Because in between there has been uh, the inception of a, uh, of a so-called rotating stall. Now, uh, this rotating stall, uh, so far as as far as I know, cannot be prevented, but can be shifted in flow regimes at the inlet of the uh, of the compressor. And so, uh, if we start blowing with continuous injection or past injection. Um, uh, at the tip of the uh, of the uh, compressor blades, what we managed to do is to improve the performance and to shift the instability and uh, evidently also the stall at lower flow rates, so we can operate the compressor even at uh, lower flow rate in safety. Uh, that's that's the, the the advantage of controlling the flow. And uh, but now let's try to to uh, have a grasp of the physics of how the, our injectors work, such that we uh, understand also how the mechanism of stabilization works. So the idea is that we have our injector. That's what I showed before in the in the little sketch. And uh, now we focus on it and we try to simulate the injector without having any flow uh, surrounding it. But as the velocities of the injector will be strongly predominant with respect to, to the mean velocity of the compressor this is a good approximation of how we will what we will see near the jet even when it's installed in a compressor so what we see here is a map of the three vorticity components for the injector so there is omega x uh, uh, omega x uh, omega y and omega z uh, depicted with respect to the reference frame we consider here where the axis of the injector is z now, uh, this, the configuration of the flow physics in this injector is very particular because we have a quanta effect which keeps the jet attached at the wall such that the jet of our injector can blow very close to the uh, gap between the carter and the blades where we want to control the instability. So this is tailored to control the flow and sweep out the vortices which if interacting they can lead to in the instability. But due to the short range of our, to the short uh, span width of our uh, injector, that's what you find here, we find a separation at the at the uh, up, uh, at the upstream part of the injector, which creates a shear layer that afterwards gets reattached and uh, generates this uh, uh, very peculiar uh, two-layer uh, uh, omega x so vorticity axial vorticity uh, uh, structures uh, transverse vorticity structures that afterwards will lead to a sort of U shape. A velocity profile. That's what uh, we we observe in our uh, in our compressor. 
Uh, that's in fact justifying the velocity profile you see here, the velocity map you see here, and that's a velocity map uh, uh, for the magnitude of the velocity, uh, but basically that's uh, representative of the streamwise velocity, so along the y direction, that's uh, uh, like 95% uh, of the whole velocity. So whenever you see this velocity map, these velocity maps, you can also think them as uh, uh, as maps of the velocity in uh, uh, y direction, and that tells you also you have to imagine that the compressor is here. That tells you also that we inject momentum, projecting it in the direction where the injector is blowing. Okay, so. Uh, we run some simulations to understand how the characteristics of the jet change with the mass flow rate we inject at the top, and that's what we call M dot. Okay, so that's the injection at the top, and we start changing it. So we start from five grams per second, then we go to one gram per second, then we go to 1.5 gram per second, and then we go to two grams per second you barely see any difference in this. So this is an indication that your flow is topologically self-similar and you can draw conclusions based on the same topology of the flow because this is robust across the uh, mass flow rates we consider. So the only difference you see in the pictures, I scroll over them once again, is basically on the numbers you see here, the color bars. That's the only basically uh, observable difference we find. And if we go a little bit more quantitative, if we compare the flow profiles at different locations in the, uh, in the uh, domain, what we find out is that they do look self-similar close enough to the injector. To the uh, sorry, close enough to the compressor. So basically, what we can say from uh, from this picture is, if we manage to carry out some uh, uh, physical analysis that can be extended across all the regimes of applicability of our injector, because the physics of the injector flow uh, flow field is self similar with respect to the mass we inject. So that's just a justification of uh, what I'm uh, going to talk afterwards about, because uh, we are going to talk about the, the uh, uh, optimization of this system. And that's just a way to say the optimization uh, can safely rely on a stable flow physics topology. Uh, now, if we go a little bit more in detail, you remember this picture from the first slide. Uh, this is one of the injector or a couple of injectors uh, because we inject always by pairs. So we have 20 pairs, 40 injectors, and we can uh, deactivate one pair out of two. That's what we are going to do in the presentation. So uh, the injector pairs will be uh, denoted by an inch, and we have either 10 injector pairs, so for 20 injectors, or 20 injector pairs, meaning 40 injectors. The injectors look like this. The flow comes out from here, and if when they are installed on the on the compressor, once again I repeat, the injector flow goes tangential to where it has been blown, tangential to the carter. So basically, it's at, it's supplying momentum between the rotor blade and the carter. What we can do with this injector is changing the flow rate, which evidently changes the injected. Uh, uh, velocity. We can change the angle of the injector, so we can rotate the injectors over several different angles, and uh, we also can change the rotational speed of the rotor, so trying the control strategy for uh, uh, different sorts of uh, operating regimes. So uh, before we talked about uh, uh, performance, that's what we uh, want to uh, finally control because, uh, as we said, it's still an application to to aeronautics. So uh, evidently, this is uh, it's important to 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 take the performance into account. And we actually have two different sort of performance that are considered. One is the power balance (PB). What we call the power balance basically is the increment of performance. Uh, uh, considering the net gain with respect to the uh, uncontrolled case. So we have the uncontrolled performance, we inject some flow, we lose some energy by injecting, uh, by injecting the flow, but 
this will change the flow physics nearby the gap so we can gain performance or lose performance. We gain performance when uh, uh, the controlled flow makes the compressor performing better. Uh, considering also a net gain with respect to the energy we injected in the system. That's why you have this term here that takes into account uh, the injected flow rate. Uh, sorry, the injected flow rate, that's Q inch. Uh, we also have another parameter that's so-called surge margin improvement. Surge margin is when we have an instability that develops uh, as a rotating stall inside the injector and it blocks uh, the the whole injector, uh, the whole sorry, uh, the, uh, that develops inside the uh, the compressor and it blocks the whole compressor, creating the uh, the sudden drop of the performance. You want to stay away from it because that's a strongly uh, a strongly uh, transient phenomenon that uh, uh, that can uh, lead to uh, very detrimental effect on your on your engine. So you keep a certain safety margin. Now, if we go uh, to the performance uh, uh, curves, this safety margin gain in terms of flow rate uh, and in terms of uh, pressure ratio is measured by the uh, surge margin uh, uh, improvement. Uh, and uh, this is also one of the parameters we want to, to improve because injecting flow, we want to make the compressor more stable to uh, rotating stall, so more safe in this sense to uh, search. How do we do that? Uh, we have experimental data and we go on with a shallow neural network where uh, we consider only two hidden layers. We have input parameters, output parameters. Uh, if you want more details, you go on uh, this publication of uh, of Mo of Mohammed, and uh, uh, I will enter a little bit more in details on what we set as input and what we set as output, and on the architecture we use. So. I don't know if the audience is very familiar with uh, neural networks. Here I have a, uh, a slide to, to remind you how, how it works. So we have an input layer, that's our X. We have four parameters of input, that's what we can control. The alpha of the injector, so the, the uh, angle at which we blow the flow. We have the velocity of blowing, that's also controlled, the number of injection pairs, either 10 or 20, and the rotation of the compress. Then we start in the first hidden layer, we compute the output of the first hidden layer using uh, the bias vector of the first layer, the weights that are computed to optimize the, system, the, the, the layer, and um, the number of neurons, which are here, N1, of the first layer and an activation function which is a uh, uh, rectilinear uh, uh, activation function that's basically uh, zero when uh, x is uh, negative. Now, uh, so we basically rectify the, the, the signal. Then we enter in the second hit the layer. We do basically the same thing, but we take in input the uh, output of the first hidden layer. We find the, the weights and we come out with an output that's our Y hat. Now the output of our hidden layer uh, uh, is gonna be uh, either the SMI total, so the surge margin uh, uh, improvement in uh, total sense, performance and flow rates, or the power balance, the PB. Uh, we use then uh, this loss function to minimize the distance between the predicted output from our uh, neural network and the experimental data, which are uh, what we trained with. Okay, so um, summarizing in a, in a nicer sketch, we get the inputs which are in green and the outputs which are in blue. Uh, PB and SMI total are not linked to each other, so we get basically two. Uh, output models to two, um, shallow uh, neural network models, one for predicting PB, the other one for predicting SMI total. Okay, so that's why you see just one output here, because basically we have two models, one that considers PB, one that considers SMI total. What we have is 175 experiments 
we do cross-validation for model selection. Uh, we apply genetic algorithms for uh, parameter, hyperparameter optimization, and the parameters we set for our neural networks are uh, written inside this table. Now, uh, this is not a, 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 an advancement in terms of strict methodology, uh, because we use classic uh, shallow neural networks or that's that there is nothing uh, nothing new in the technique we use uh, the interest of using this technique for uh, application uh, uh, problems like the one i real actually real problems uh, engineering problems like the one i just showed is that we have a little amount of data so uh, neural networks, uh, especially deep neural networks, normally they do have uh, major problems in uh, converging on this data. So the advancement uh, of, of our study is to show that this problem can be, these methodologies can be applicable to real problem for optimization strategies, which are robust and how to do it. And uh, 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 that's, that's a measure, uh, it's a measure advancement because so far we use them on uh, much simpler systems or much larger data sets. So uh, to carry out the optimization, what we use is uh, uh, genetic algorithms. Once again, go in the paper if you want more details. Here, I just uh, uh, talk about a few uh, uh, a few uh, steps to conceptually follow what we do. So there is a J1 that's a surrogate model for the SMI total. When we talk about surrogate model, means this shallow neural network, right? And what we do it, we consider the surrogate model for a fixed omega. So we go for from R3 to R, meaning from V injection, N injection, alpha injection to SMI total. Omega is fixed. We do the same with PB, okay, with the power balance. That's a performance part. And then we use a B objective unconstrained optimization in which we have this lambda. That's the parameter. That's a trade-off. Either we want to optimize for SMI total, in that case, our lambda will be zero and we don't have PB in the optimization cost function, or we want to optimize for PB, then lambda is one and we don't have we don't have SMI total, or we want to optimize for a trade-off between the two of them. In that case, we can play with this lambda parameter. Then we do genetic algorithm for optimization. That means we follow this algorithm. So we specify the lambda, we select the cost function, we set omega as said before, and we have three uh, optimization boundaries on N, uh, uh, three optimization uh, input parameters. We want to find the optimum in these conditions. And uh, we, we uh, come out with the objective function calculations. We do parent selections. That's a genetic algorithm, I remember. Uh, I, I remind you. Then we do crossover. So we, we uh, compare the parents which have been uh, 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 more successful in optimizing. We do mutations. So we, we combine them, uh, combine their characteristics. We uh, come out with the new generations that has been selected by the genetic algorithm, and we iterate until uh, we optimize this. So let's let's first start with the validation. So we have a training data set, validation of our neural network, right? We have a training data set, and we have a testing data set. So we train with the with the uh, points you have you see here, and uh, whenever you are on the bisectrix, this is meaning that the experimental uh, power balance matches the predicted uh, neural network power balance. Uh, as you can see, uh, in this case, the training is uh, quite successful, and when we go to test it, we have uh, quite good uh, statistics from the mean square error and the R2. If we do the same with the SMI total, so with the search margin improvement, so the safety kind of factor, uh, we we observe also a very good uh, uh, a very good uh, statistics for uh, the R square and the mean square error, which means that even with this small amount of data uh, in the data set, we do manage to arrive to uh, a robust uh, model, a robust surrogate model, but I remind you, we had to split the data set into 96% training data set and 4% testing data set. So we had to attribute the 
training data set a lot of uh, uh, points and we predict a few of them. That's kind of a constraint which uh, uh, somehow limits uh, the, the uh, predictivity of, of our system or somehow the statistics we can, we can come out with. But once we have the surrogate model which is tested, how do we want to use it? Uh, well, uh, we can go back on our sketch for the control and then we have a velocity injected with a certain angle and the blades of the rotor which are uh, rotating at a constant omega uh, and that are considered at a given mean radius. So if we go to the rotating reference frame, what we have is that the injected velocity, we do the, the triangle of velocities. And so we come out with two parameters, which, which are the two uh, uh, natural parameters for the rotor blades, which we want to control. And they are related to the injection, uh, to the injected velocity normalized with a, a rotational velocity and the angle of attack seen by the blade uh, from uh, from the uh, from the injector we do not correct for mean flow because we assume it's small so if we go to constraint optimization in this system uh, what we find out when we talk about constraint optimization we talk about constraining uh, finding the optimum within the data set of our uh, uh, of our uh, experimental database. So if the experimental database has angles which go from 30 degrees to minus 45 degrees, we look for an optimum in that range. That's a constraint optimization in this sense. And first we run it over the power balance, then we run it over the SMI total. We don't merge the two, we don't do by, uh, uh, we don't do yet the, uh, uh, by functional uh, uh, optimization. In this sense, we find the optima and we find out that uh, there are optima which uh, sit on the uh, uh, attack of the angle of attack, which is close to zero, which means we they tend to limit the separations. And at a certain point, we also find optima on large angle of attack, which means they are prone to the our injection uh, 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 flow is prone to change uh, the uh, strongly to change the flow uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, blade at uh, the separation of the blade. So we tend to counteract on a separation. In this case, on the other hand, we tend to promote a sweeping, right? But this is constrained optimization. What can we do with uh, neural networks is also trying to uh, extrapolate. This is always a very risky uh, uh, operation with the uh, with training that with uh, neural networks, and that's why we carry out more experiments to validate our uh, extrapolation. So uh, we condition the model and correctly select. Uh, uh, the parameters for our uh, neural network to be capable to show that there is a certain form of uh, 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 extrapolation possible with our robust extrapolation possible with our neural network. And we do verify it with experiments that our extrapolation is robust, but this strongly depends on the testing, uh, on how we split training and testing data set. This is a key point that's discussed in this paper where we characterize it also with sensitivity maps. So if we now go to the unconstrained optimization, what we figure out is you see what was before minus 45 degrees, so it was fixed to the limit of our, uh, of our uh, experiments, has now uh, significantly exceeded uh, the the limit of our uh, experimental uh, testing uh, uh, benchmark and the angle of attack for the control is even larger than what predicted before. So this is a control that tends to strongly counteract the flow on the uh, the separation flow on on the blade of the compressor. On the other hand, when we have small angles, I remind you that's that's more like a way to uh, to uh, uh, Align with the uh, minimal uh, uh, minimal separation for for the for the profile, so reduce the angle of attack basically. 
So single objective optimization leads to significant different conditions, especially when you go outside of the uh, of the limits of your uh, uh, experiments. But we can also do uh, uh, B uh, by uh, uh, objective optimization, and in this case, we come out with a Pareto curve. Uh, so with a limit of our optimization, which takes into account all the conditions for all the lambdas we have. So for uh, a cost function that makes uh, the SMI total and the PV. So uh, uh, here you find random inputs, which are given in gray, and the Pareto curve, which is given in yellow. That defines the, uh, the optima. And then you have the best optimum that maximizes the cost function. That's B1, B2, B3 for the three different flow, uh, uh, for the three different rotation rates we have, and uh, the two constrained optimizations on uh, only on uh, the two sorry uh, unconstrained optimization only on uh, PB uh, or on uh, SMI uh, total that are represented by A1C1, A2C2, A3C3 in the case in which, as we said, lambda is either zero or one. So in this case, we can carry out the constraint by objective optimization where and A1 and C1 are basically supposed to be the same uh, uh, values we found before or almost the same values. Uh, and uh, B1 is the uh, the best optimum we can find in the sense that it's the optimum that optimizes the cost function uh, in uh, in a global sense. In this case, you see the 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 global optimum selects actually the condition on which we strongly counteract the separation on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the blade, and here it sits somehow. In uh, in between, it depends on the flow rate, on the rotation rate we have. But this is the constrained optimization uh, for a by objective uh, for the by objective case. We can do the same without constraining the optimization. So removing the constraint on the angle and removing the constraint on the maximum velocity we can inject. So if we remove the constraint on the maximum velocity, basically we are we find out that we are already close to uh, the to the uh, optimum. So basically our velocity was not really a constraint, but the angle of injection went far beyond uh, uh, what, the, what the capabilities of our injector was. And that changed the angle of attack significantly. The VR, uh, as we said, is a normalized uh, uh, injection velocity. So the bioobjective optimization can lead to significantly different optima, uh, which uh, which are uh, detailed by the B1, B2, B3 that's a, that are global optima, and they describe the Pareto curve, which is uh, guiding us towards an optimization of our system. So if we look a little bit more in details on uh, the Pareto curves we have for all the cases comparing with between the constrained and the unconstrained optimization, we find a few uh, differences, but uh, globally the, uh, uh, the, the trend is, is very uh, similar to one another. Uh, we can, okay, in terms of optimization, that's what we could do, but starting from a very naive point of view without understanding much how this optimization actually takes place. So what we can do is trying to enter a little bit more in details and uh, selecting a given uh, injection velocity and seeing how for a given number of injection pairs and for a given velocity uh, uh, of rotation, rotation rate, how the SMI total and the uh, power balance change up to a change of the local angle of attack for the uh, for the blades, and here we see a very non-trivial uh, shape of uh, the relation between the two, which is given by our surrogate model. So if we do it for different uh, velocity of uh, uh, injection normalized by uh, by the uh, omega r, uh, then we find out that there is a certain self-similarity in the profile of SMI total time, uh, over PB, but after a while we start losing this self-similarity when we inject at very lower, a much lower flow rate, which is meaning when we inject at a velocity that gets strongly impacted also by the mean flow 
and then that suggests another physics is taking place at lower BR. If we go uh, a little bit more uh, in details for this kind of optimizations, what we figure out is that there are uh, actually two different uh, 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 curves which we can expect if we change the number of injector pairs as well. This is a parameter that never entered our previous optimizations because, sorry, I, I go back a second, all the optimal conditions we found before were for 20 injection pairs. And this sounds normal because the more you want to, the more you want to uh, to control, the more you have to inject. But if we consider uh, 10 injection pairs, we are not that far from uh, improvement in performance or improvement in uh, in uh, surge margin. Um, for uh, uh, between 10 pairs and 20 injection pairs, but uh, with 10 injection pairs, we do have to use half of the uh, supply for uh, for the injection uh, mass flow rate, which is meaning at the end that we reduce the cost. So uh, uh, another point which I want to stress in this plot is that the optimization is everything but trivial because here we find a very sharp transition which is actually discontinuity we figured out later uh, between the injection angles so the two regimes we talked about before you clearly identify them when you plot the maximum pb and the maximum of the smi total uh, with respect to the uh, injection velocity and you plot you you depict it in terms of visa so what we do is we take the maxima at the uh, in the vertical position, the maximum of the horizontal position, and we plot them here. What we find is this contribute to understand even further uh, how the optima uh, of the system are generated and to understand the discontinuities that we find, which are uh, which have a lot of physics to be uh, still interpreted because you sharply transition from one regime of optimum to the other regime of optimum where you try to optimize a different flow physics. So this is just to make a point that local optima help identifying cost functions because they tell you, uh, they give you a hint about the continuity or discontinuity in this case of your uh, optimum strategy. And on top, they suggest that uh, new parameters should be included in the cost function. For example, the number of injector should be potentially be taken care of if we want to include in our engineering system how much it would cost to control it, which is actually a parameter so far not taken into account. Jo going to the conclusions, we use shallow neural network for uh, effective uh, to prove effectiveness in uh, complex flow control, so engineering applications um, is robust. For other axial compressors, this has been uh, uh, proven. Um, I didn't show it here, but we, we we tested it with another compressor and our technique and the same architecture is proven to be robust. Uh, changing the number of injection changed the robustness of the uh, uh, optimization, changed the cost, and we should potentially uh, uh, include it into a trade-off that doesn't just consider the power balance and the search margin improvement. Uh, we could come out, we could use the shallow neural network to uh, feed it into a genetic algorithm. Uh, sorry, here there is a typo, it's genetic algorithm for Pareto curve and produce B objective constrained and unconstrained optimization. Uh, the local optima suggests also including number of injectors in uh, uh, engine bleed air and uh, potentially that can uh, lead to non-dimensional form to generalize the principles we understand with flow control. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope that was uh, not too fast and uh, I, I would invite whoever has questions to, to just ask them. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, so the audience in online or offline, feel free to listen. Let's go. Uh, maybe I will just ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, 
Francisco. So Francisco, mm-hmm. uh, when you were uh, swaying those uh, power balance and SMI total, uh, can you just inter? I mean, explain to me what does that mean when it's a negative percentage? Uh, I mean, yes. it, it's it's more maybe more physical thing than the machine learning part. But I'm just curious to know what does that represent. No, no, that's that's good. So. Let's see. I can go in a second. I go to the definition. Okay, here we are. So um, uh, let, let me go to the other curves. So in, in uh, the SMI total, uh, let's start with the SMI total. That's basically the distance between this point here, that's the baseline, that's the uncontrolled case, and the last stable point of the controlled case. That's the distance between the two. Okay, so if the SMI total is negative, this is meaning that this distance gets uh, in this sense, okay, distance that gets negative, it's impossible, but it's uh, the sign distance uh, gets negative in the sense you are losing power balance, so you go down here, or you are losing uh, uh, the flow rate. Uh, so you you shift the curve towards higher flow rates um, uh, or both. So basically you're losing stability or you're losing uh, uh, performance or both. That's the SMI total, right? Because that's the definition which is given here. Okay, so this is the, the whenever you lose uh, in one direction, in a horizontal direction, you're losing uh, uh, you're losing uh, stability, and uh, in vertical direction, if you go uh, downwards, you're losing performance. The two contribute to an SMI total which can be negative in this sense. Uh, for the power uh, balance, uh, that's a little bit trickier because uh, so if we go back to the plot of before. Uh, the controlled case you see tends to shift upward uh, the power balance, the, the, the pressure difference uh, produced by the compressor. OK, so you tend to say you gained in performance, right? The problem is you use the part of the energy to, to blow air inside the compressor. So this is meaning that uh, Every time you control the flow, you are losing a part of the energy and you are potentially gaining in pressure difference across the compressor. So if the uh, if the budget, if the net budget between what you included in the what, uh, the energy you you gave to the system uh, uh, subtracted to the energy you gained from the system is positive, your power balance uh, is positive in percentile. If it's negative, so if you injected more than what you gained, then it's negative. Okay. Yeah. So the other question in your result part, which you were showing at the beginning in the tabular form, some of your entries are highlighted in red. Does do they mean something specific or? Yes, so uh, maybe I was I didn't stress this uh, enough in a second. So these ones are entries which are constrained. So these are at the limit of what we can uh, uh, produce with experiments. In the sense, our experiments have injection uh, angles which go from 30 to minus 45 degrees. Okay. So. If we are at minus 45, that's where we constrain the optimization. It's like we only look for an optimum uh, inside the 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 uh, range of angles and injection velocities uh, we have. That's a constraint. If we go to the unconstrained, you see that this number gets overcome, and the red one is just always to say we go beyond. Uh, the uh, the regime at uh, at which we can uh, the, the the experimental data set. This is just marked in red because I commit a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Same Thank for you. the velocity. Yeah. 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 Sure. So, any other question from the the audience from online or offline?
if not then let's thanks uh, francisco thank once you. again the next thank you speaker thank you for the invitation thank you francisco